How is everyone doing today? My name is Nate Meeker. I am the esports director at the University of Akron, University in Ohio in the United States. Um, I operate the esports program here. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about a few different topics. I'll give you a brief introduction to the esports program that I run here at the University of Akron, and then we'll go ahead and get into a topic about building connections into various esports programs and how those connections can be used to help the students that are a part of those programs either make their careers possible or expand upon careers that are available to them in the realm of esports. Um, but before we get going, let's take a quick look at the program overview that I help to operate here at the University of Akron. So I'm going to go ahead and share a screen with everyone here. And you can go ahead and see here what we've got going on. We actually have three different components to the program that we operate here at Akron. This background behind me is one of the facilities that we use here. But we've got three components. One of those components is a varsity component. We also have a club component and a recreational or free component free play component to our program as well. So at the varsity level, currently we offer seven different games and we are moving into an eighth for the fall. I'll talk a little bit about each of those and give some more details. At the club level, we operate for a variety of different games to help engage students on campus. And then the free play aspect is for anyone to come in and utilize the facilities to play any game that they would like. Um, on the facility side of things, we do actually have three different facilities, basically PC cafes here on campus that are available for students to use. One of those is dedicated to the varsity teams. One is dedicated to the club teams uh, and the different gaming clubs on campus. And then one is more of a recreational free play area. So for all different things, we have a different facility for those students to utilize. On the varsity side of things, currently we offer varsity scholarships and positions for seven different games, League of Legends, Rocket League, Rainbow Six Siege, Fortnite, Hearthstone, CSGO, Overwatch, and we are going to be adding in Valorant for the upcoming school year due to the popularity. So for us, we offer different things to those, uh, those students that are part of the program. Primarily, it is a scholarship-based program. So every member of the teams, as well as coaches, uh, student coaches and student managers, they receive a scholarship to be a part of that program and compete against other colleges, both internationally and around the country here in the US. We, of course, as I mentioned before, provide dedicated facilities for those students. So they have a spot to always practice and play on campus. And we do ask that they practice and play in person within our facilities. And we've got great faculty support here on campus. We have three full-time staff members that work for our esports program, and then a variety of different connecting services that we help to provide students uh, a way for them to succeed in their classes, to graduate on time, and to make sure that they're doing everything that they can to stay up in school and make progress towards their degree. Uh, in addition to that, we do yearly tryouts that are all facilitated through our facilities on campus for those different games so that we can make sure that we're maintaining the top level of competition. It's another picture of one of the varsity facilities on campus. Uh, as far as competition level goes, we are nationally ranked in most of the games that we compete in. And we have at the moment, eight different national championships under our belt, going for three more this year in a variety of different games. On the club side of things, any game that you can name or think of, we probably have a club for that particular game. These are PC games, console games, any type of game that exists and is popular on campus. We have students organizing club-based activities for those various games. So those pictures that you see there on the screen, League of Legends, Rocket League, Minecraft, Super Smash Brothers, Call of Duty, Madden, 2K, those are just a small smattering of games that we offer at the club level. We've got students that organize uh, for competitive games, for casual games. If it's something that they're interested in, we're interested in helping them to participate in that club type activity. Some of these clubs are really large in nature where they have 150, 200 students that are interested. So for example, Overwatch, others are a little bit smaller in nature due to the game not being as popular or not being as big. 
for us, uh, the biggest clubs that we have on campus are a fighting games club that includes Smash Brothers and other platform based fighters and traditional fighters like Street Fighter, as well as games like Overwatch, Rocket League and League of Legends. Uh, but we have large club events that go on throughout the course of the year. Some of those are focused on individual games and then others are more focused on a wide variety of different games. For clubs, we also offer the opportunity for students on campus to get leadership experience and leadership opportunities through their leadership that they can uh, participate in through that club activity. So they can become a president, a vice president, a treasurer, a secretary of these different clubs, which really helps them have some more resume lines when they're coming out of school. Great way to engage other students on campus. And there is no skill level uh, that is mandatory or that needs to needs to be to be part of these. You could be a very talented player or you could be a new player to these games. Everyone is welcome to these club activities. Here's another picture of some of those club activities. It may look familiar to the background that is in my uh, video here as well. Uh, this was during one of the larger club events that we've had here on campus. Uh, in addition, we also have free play facilities that are open for any student to come on in and use totally for free. So we've got a facility that has top of the line PCs, Xboxes, PlayStations, Nintendo Switches. Students can come in and play a game that we own or they can play a game that they bring into the spaces uh, either by themselves or with their friends. We're open noon to midnight, so our noon to 11 p.m. students are able to come in and use those facilities completely for free. So it's a great way for students on campus to get connected and to find other students who play similar games. Very gaming centric focused here on campus, which has been pretty fun to see. Uh, so that is a little bit about the program that I operate here with my colleagues at the University of Akron, those three components, the varsity component, the club component, and then the recreational component. I'm going to go ahead and stop this screen share really quick and go straight into another screen share that has a secondary presentation. And this presentation here is entitled Esports Opportunities and Connections at the University Level. So just go ahead and give me two seconds here and I will have it up and available. And there we go. Okay, so we should be able to see this one now. I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the chat on the other side of the screen here. If you do have a question while we're going through this, feel free to ask it in the chat and uh, I will have it forwarded to me so I can answer it live here for you guys on stream. So we've got esports opportunities and connections at the university level. <clears throat> One caveat here to this presentation is that even though the title here is university level, a lot of this is very applicable at the club level as well as at the high school level. So there are many things here that you would be able to do as a local high school or a local esports club. It's not restricted to the university level. There are a couple of things that I'll mention that we have done here at the University of Akron that may be university specific, but for the vast majority of these kind of tips and tricks, uh, most of them will work at a variety of different levels. So the primary goal here with this presentation um, is, is a few different things. So the first thing that I'm looking for folks to be able to get out of this is that they'll be able to take a closer look at some different types of esports programs and the benefits that they can provide to students and that they can tailor their own program, whether that's a school-led program, a club-led program, an institutional-led program that can help develop these different types of opportunities and give students more opportunities to experience those connections. There'll also be some action items on these different subtopics about what we can do to kind of improve our own program and implement some of these changes to the program that we have. Uh, also, too, thinking about their your own program, how is it being run, are there areas here where you may be able to connect things that you may, may be able to do that we're talking about here that help to provide you with a little bit of insight. Um, also, too, and finally, you're going to leave with a little bit more of an idea as to how to tie some of these esports programs into some more traditionally academic programs on campus or within a school or connecting to a local school, even if that's not the mandate of your program, which, which may be the case for a lot of folks. So first thing uh, that's important here is a little bit of background on different types of esports programs. These types are traditionally the types that you would see within the collegiate realm in the U.S. right now. So in the U.S., there are about 200 
actually it might be more than that now, maybe 250 collegiate esports programs. And there are a couple of different types of them. Uh, the type one that we have there at the top, type A, th this is in no particular order, by the way. Type A is a varsity only program where their goal is not necessarily to engage the student population on campus. Rather, their goal is to produce a winning team or a number of winning teams. And typically those types of programs focus on the 0.0001% of your player base. And they focus on either heavy scholarship or if it's an organizational led program, they may focus on paying the players and the focus is on winning. Uh, the type B type program is a student centered and led program, maybe a community led program as well with a focus on engagement and grassroots movements where the community is hosting a variety of different events. Sure, some of those may be competitive in nature, others might not be. The primary focus is engaging the community. Um, and then type C is more of an institutional type program. This is the type that we operate here at the University of Akron, where it is led by the institutional arm of the university. And we kind of do all of it. We do the varsity side of things. We do the club side of things. We do the recreational and community side, but we are led by university staff like myself. Uh, the reason why we're bringing this up is because I think there's a common misconception that the only types of program that can benefit from the things that we're talking about are a B and a C type program. However, that, that's not the case at all. So all of these programs have the ability to connect with students and give those students an opportunity to connect with the program and gain more experience in the realm of esports with the idea that you'll then be able to take this knowledge and, and make a make an impact in your future job career and be able to really connect with that. So we're gonna take a little bit of a deeper dive into a, for a, a few certain areas of academics and how we can connect our esports programs with those areas in academics. Um, although before we begin, there are a couple of things that we should talk about. So why do we care about doing this? Why do we care about uh, connecting students with a variety of different opportunities? So for us, the first thing at the collegiate level is, and this would be the same at the high school level or even at the club and community level is that it improves student retention or it improves program retention. So the more opportunities that you're able to connect students with, the better they're gonna do with staying in that program and staying connected. Uh, in addition to that, it gives students opportunities to gain real world experience and have real world experience with some in-demand jobs that are in the space, both nationally and internationally. It also helps to drive student engagement around the program. So for us, one of the big things is making sure that other folks who are part of the program are excited about what's going on within the program. And this kind of helps to drive that excitement. Fourth, uh, it can help to further engage students in the area that they're studying. And we'll take a look at these areas here in a few minutes. And it can kind of help them to see how they may be able to connect this gaming passion that they have with a future career in gaming and esports. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of these are going to be a large doorway to a career in esports. Rather, a lot of these are traditional jobs that may have a component of gaming or esports related to them that that student may be then able to take and answer questions in an interview to be a good applicant for these types of positions and transition their passion into an area that really allows them to utilize that passion on a day-to-day -day -day in the office type setting. Uh, and then finally, it can help you get more community individuals, faculty members, staff members on board with the program because they're going to see all these external connections that your program is building. Um, also, too, before we get going, there are a couple of common misconceptions about doing these types of things with your students. So misconception number one is I hear folks say all the time that they feel like if they hand over control of some part of their program that they're going to lose control of it. And that's not necessarily true because a lot of the times our role as an administrator or our role as a coach or a teacher is to be a mentor for the students that are in our programs. And this is another way for us to be a mentor where we're essentially helping them take the reins, take the lead, lead these community-based events and really succeed in their own way. 
And then the other misconception that I get is I'll hear a lot of people talk about how they think the only jobs in esports are, are players or coaches, and that's definitely not true. So players and coaches probably, again, make up that 0.00001% of folks who are involved in esports. And sure, there are jobs that can make a lot of money in that field, but that's not where the vast majority of the jobs are at. Like traditional sports, most of the jobs are in the surrounding area of esports and gaming, the support roles. And that's where we're really focused here today. We're not focused on the player side of things or the coach side of things, although we will touch base on some of the coaching aspect of things. But this is the, the ancillary jobs, the support jobs, the roles that you can transition to as not a 0.001% player, but rather someone who's interested and, and passionate about gaming and esports and wants to make a career out of that. Uh, and then I get a lot of folks who say, well, they don't have any esports focus at their particular university or club or school. And so some of this seems impossible. Really what this is going to do is this will allow students who are interested in these particular areas, regardless of where you're at in your program development, to get some experience uh, in these particular fields. You could have one computer, maybe two computers, and you'd be able to, to do something like this fairly easily with your program development. So let's go ahead and take a look at these different areas that we're going to be looking at today. So. I've tried to focus this down to five key areas that we can look to connect with, and then we can look to make some positive changes for students by the way that we handle our programs development. Those are education, sports science, psychology, sports management, and communications. So these are five primary areas of focus for study for us here at the University of Akron. These may not fit for every institution, but there are certainly some crossover things that students who are interested in these areas may be able to take on while they're in middle school or high school or while they're working for a, or while they're participating in an esports club outside of school. These are areas that they could in turn want to study later on it may help students be interested in going to college and pursuing a de degree because they can see the connection, uh, or it may help them get some field experience in these areas before they would head into the job market, which is really valuable. As someone who's hired folks in, in the realm of esports, particularly in higher education, one area that we always see lacking is we don't see a big connection between what the folks have done in their prior career or before they graduated college and esports that they would like to get into. So providing them opportunities to do something in one of these areas really gives them a leg up against the competition where they can say, I've coached a team, I've led a team, I've done this particular type of event, I've led these areas. And that's gonna help them get in a door, get an, get an interview that they may not have otherwise been able to get. So let's take a quick look at each of these different fields. We're gonna start with education. So why are we looking at education? Why, does, why is it important here? Uh, for us, we're helping to prepare, prepare graduating students for opportunity in secondary and tertiary education. This could be in primary education as well. I know that esports and gaming classes focuses is starting to expand younger and younger and there are more opportunities to do this with younger students so we could definitely change that and say younger is also possible uh, and then we're also looking at education for the curriculum development side of things with an eye on esports and gaming if you've been a teacher in the classroom or if you've been a student in the classroom you're probably well aware that finding curriculum or finding classroom material with a focus on gaming or esports is very difficult. And I think the primary reason for that is that for the most part, folks who have been doing curriculum development classwork for the last 15 or 20 years didn't really grow up with gaming. Uh, that's starting to change now. Folks are growing up with gaming being, being very common in, in their household and their community, and they wanna see a connection to that in what they're learning. So for us, the reason why we focus on education is because we're helping to lead that next generation of college students who may then be able to utilize that in their classroom setting to help teach students in a way that really connects to what they, what they know and what they learn. 
Um, and then also too that first one. So we are preparing that that next generation of teachers. And so folks that are coming out of the program with a background in gaming and esports can really speak to a different type of student population that they may not have been able to speak to without that. So some of the jobs that are currently in the field that may utilize this knowledge, this this expertise in gaming and esports, obviously teacher in the classroom, curriculum development, uh, and a curriculum development officer, someone who's working on textbooks, someone who's working on standards, higher education admin, so a job like what I do, uh, coaches obviously, counselors as well, because it's very important to understand where many of these students are coming from and the connections that they may have. So let's take a look at how did we create some of these opportunities for students who are who are interested in education, maybe interested in becoming a teacher later on after they graduate. We're going to look at both internal opportunities that we have created as as a unit and then some external opportunities that can help students uh, outside of the campus. So internally, there's a few different things that we've done. First, we've developed a pretty robust summer camp program. And we've given students that are interested the opportunity to work for that program. And very similarly to what they may be doing in an educational setting, they're acting as an admin, as a mentor. They write a lot of the curriculum. They teach some of the classes, their group leaders, their class leaders, their coaches for these games. All of that is directly applicable to what a future career might be in education. So these are all things that you would be doing as an educator when you finish up school. And they're getting opportunities to do that with gaming while they're still in college, which has been a gigantic help. In addition to that, we have a student coach for each of the teams uh, at the varsity level, and then some of the club teams have student coaches as well. This is giving students an opportunity that they would have never been able to get outside of this esports program. Uh, right now in the US, a lot of high school and middle school education jobs are looking for coaches who can come in and teach a math program or an English program or a science program. And then after school, move into a coaching role for some of these teams, some of these esports teams. And it's very difficult for them to find folks who have any experience in this. We're building that experience now at the college level. So students that graduate can then come out and say, look at this opportunity I had. This is something that you'd want to to hire me for because I can come in and do this for your program. Now I have the experience to do it and it's giving them an advantage going into the job field. Uh, in addition to that, I mentioned curriculum development before. We've helped work with a couple of GAs on campus who have been in the curriculum development field for existing programs. And it's really helped to tie a lot of what they're doing now or what they're trying to develop now for curriculum with, uh, with an esports focus. And then, of course, on the research side of things as well. So research is very important in the field of education, and there's very little research that's been done on esports and education or how do we tie esports into education. So anytime that we can work with a research component, we're more than happy to provide those students with that opportunity. And then we've got some external partnerships that we've helped to build as well. So external partnerships with local high schools that uh, we've sent out students to help coach some of those teams or to provide mentorship opportunities for programs uh, that are at the high school level or middle school level. And really what this has been able to do is it's given the students that we have that are part of our program here at Akron, the opportunity to work with those local middle schools, work with those local high schools, get some of that coaching, that mentoring experience, and then transition that into the job field. And of course, it's helped to benefit those middle school and high school programs pretty immensely because they have someone coming in with more expert knowledge than they might have had otherwise. As I mentioned, it's hard to find someone who's teaching at a middle school or high school that has enough knowledge in one of these games to be able to coach it effectively. We've got students that are able to do that. So we help facilitate that partnership. In addition to that, we've worked with the rec centers that are both locally and regionally. And those rec centers are looking for other ways to engage the youth that's around them. A lot of the traditional sports that they would normally do, soccer, baseball, football, basketball, the numbers are going down and down and down, whereas the interest in gaming and esports is going up and up and up. But they don't necessarily have the personnel to, to execute those partnerships or execute those programs. So we've tried to send some students out to those, build those connections so we can help one, students get employment, and two, help those programs grow to encourage uh, the partnership of their, their youth to engage in gaming and esports in a healthy way. 
So for education, I suppose the action point here would be find a middle school, find a high school, find a local recreation center that you can partner up with, that you can team up with to find a group of students that, you know, you can mentor as, as a coach yourself and then have them mentor smaller groups of folks that are interested in gaming and esports because it's going to be healthy for the population. It's going to be healthy for the students that are engaged there and it'll help them grow professionally and it'll help your program grow as well. Sports science is the next one up here on the docket. So sports science, why are we taking a look at sports science? Uh, so for us, this goes back to the research component that there is very, very little that has been published uh, in the field of sports science in regard to esports. We, we need to be able to help students that are, that are passionate in esports and we need to be able to provide them with realistic research in their field of how do they get better at these games? What are some healthy habits that they can develop? Sure, there's a lot of articles that have been written out there on the internet, but very few of them have any educational background at all. Very few of them have any research background at all. And these are just things that folks are writing about in their opinion the research opportunities here are really endless and we can provide students now with an opportunity to be some of the first in the field to do this research, to get these numbers, to get research out there, to be published. And this is a very big driving factor for us as well to provide the opportunity for one, the school to be able to do this. And then two students to have the opportunity to, to do that research, to actively engage in it. And then also, too, uh, this has a huge positive impact on your own team or your own organization through different welfare offerings. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide here. But we've been able to provide opportunities for students at the university to work for the program. And then that, in turn, has had, had a gigantic positive impact on our students that are part of the varsity program. Jobs in the field for this, there are actually a ton. This is just a few of them. Uh, team organizations, so dietitian, trainers, nutritionists, personal trainers, data scientists with an esports focus, researcher. A lot of these are jobs that you know you could get as a professional. And then there may be somebody that comes into your office that has an injury or a mental condition or an addiction related to gaming and esports. And without this type of background, you might not know how to help them because there's no class that teaches you how to do this. There's very little research that teaches you how to do this. There's probably not a mentor in that space that can teach you how to do this. The only way you can learn this is by getting hands-on experience and an opportunity when you're in school to do that is fantastic. So this is really the reason that we've, we've driven behind sports science here. So some internal and external opportunities that we've helped to create for students. Internally, what we've done ourselves, uh, we have a couple of students from the School of Sports Science who work on diet and exercise planning for our varsity teams. And so that takes a look at, there's 53 folks that are part of the varsity teams right now. It takes a look at the diet and the exercise logs that our teams are filling out, as well as uh, analytical data from a comparison of here's what they're eating, here's how much they're exercising or what their overall physical fitness is versus what is their in-game performance and is there a correlation? And we found that there is a pretty strong correlation between a positive diet and positive exercise and these teams' performance. So this has given students a good opportunity to study that and then have some data to go back on and a great opportunity to get an in in that job field as well. We also have a team analyst for each of our teams. And this is a big part of traditional sports is finding someone to run the numbers behind the team. Are they performing better in the evening? Are they performing better in the morning? Are they performing better with this particular teammate on that particular map with this particular setup? And this is something where it is relatively new to, to sports in general and definitely to esports. So for us, we've helped to provide an opportunity for students to gain that experience while they're still in school, which has been huge. Uh, research publication is something that we've got some students working on as well in conjunction with the professors and school and different departments here at the school. So it's given them an opportunity to do something that's totally at the forefront of uh, esports and research development. You'll see me mention research quite often. And then in addition to that, we've got summer camp program development there again. So we've got students working on the exercise component, the diet component of what that, that program can bring to students so that when we're introducing esports and gaming to folks that are younger, because the summer camp 
ages typically younger. We're then introducing healthy habits that go along with gaming as well. So we, we're getting in front of younger and younger students to help them become healthy gamers and in the long run have their development be solid throughout the course of their development and, and career. External opportunities, we've created some internships and part-time work with uh, local regional fitness centers, especially ones that have had a focus in coaching and personal training. So we've got a really nice partnership where we send some of our students out to do individual uh, fitness coaching, esports coaching, esports personal training, and that has provided those students with a great opportunity. Some of them have tra transitioned that into a career straight after college as well. Uh, and then again, doing some local area high school connections. So in addition to the coaching component, the educational component, we're also working with the local high schools to help develop that sports science component where it's not only about improving in the game, but it's about improving their diet, improving their, their physical health, their mental health, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So action point from sports science, I suppose, would be the biggest thing that I would suggest is to find students who are interested in the physical component and then all the folks that are part of your program now or will be part of the program track that data take a look at you know what are the, what's the diet from these folks what kind of exercise plans are they on and is there an opportunity to improve both of those through the connection that you have with the program and that'll give a student or a young person the opportunity to experience that and get firsthand experience managing diets, managing exercise for a program that they may not have otherwise been able to get. Next one here is psychology. Give me one sec. So psychology here, um, very much like sports science, the field is really lacking when it comes to research and what can be done to help players on, on the mental side of things. So <clears throat> One of the biggest things that we noticed when we started the program here about four years ago was that most of the folks that were coming to play for our varsity teams and our club teams didn't necessarily have a background in, in sports or club connections so that it was difficult for them to transition into that environment because they didn't have a huge background with it. So when they were losing or doing poorly, there weren't great coping strategies for those players and those teams. They didn't really understand how to bounce back because when they were playing online, they would play with different folks all the time. They'd queue once, maybe they'd win, maybe they'd lose, they'd queue up again, totally different teammate, totally new situation. That's not how it works in a team environment. In a team environment, you're constantly queuing back up with the same people. You're getting connected again and again and again with, with the same folks. So you need to understand how to improve as a team. And that's really allowed us to bring in some folks from psychology that are interested in studying this and say, okay, well, how do we approach the mental side of things? How do we improve mental fortitude and mental toughness, toughness within the folks that are on the team? And as folks who have been in the field, there's no research for them to fall back on. They can't look at a paper that's been published and say, well, so-and-so said this about psychology and esports because it doesn't exist. So again, they're kind of at the forefront there of being these researchers in the field. And luckily we have a pretty big psychology department here on campus. So it's been great to be able to connect with those students. Uh, of course, there are quite a few jobs in the field, team doctors, psychologists, analysts, private practitioners as well. So you would more and more as we see more and more gaming being a common thing and more and more team esports teams coming up, there's going to be more problems that folks are experiencing on the mental health side of things. And if we can develop professionals in that field now, the better that those folks are going to fare in the future. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop and take a couple questions here, which may have been from the previous slides. So I've got one from Robbie. He says, how are we Africans participate? Plus, how are we to manage out networks? Because our ping is very high. So as 
most of these things are kind of action points that can be taken anywhere in the world because most of the time this is things that you can connect with at a local or regional level let's say you're connecting with a local middle school a local high school a local college or a local sports club or a local esports organization this isn't necessarily something that's specific to to my college or a college in the u.s this is something that anyone can do with folks that are a part of their program. So these are some ways to connect folks that are part of your program as either a player, an individual, and connect them with a more a professional organization or professional field. Uh, on the ping side of things, most of this is not necessarily talking about ping. This is talking more about how to get folks realistic job experience that are interested in esports. On the ping side of things, I think it ends up being a lot more of a local competition, but I, I feel your pain on that one. I know that there are certain places that definitely have a hard time with the, with the ping aspect of things. Uh, and then Selman asked, what are the prerequisites for students and where do they sign up? I've got a link for our website at the end. So if there are students that are interested in, in getting connected with our particular program, I can definitely give a link to that at the end here. But this is more of a generalist view on things. So these are folks that are interested in, in connecting professionally with esports. And these are things that organizations can do to help provide those connections. Uh, so jobs in the field, we already talked about that. Team doctor, psychologist, analyst, private practitioner, going back to the slides here. Um, we've got some internal and external opportunities. Internal, again, opportunities that we have been able to provide for students on campus. And then external opportunities, opportunities that we've been able to drive from external sources or external partnerships and things that other folks may be able to copy to do as well. So internally, We've had a lot of folks uh, over the last couple of years take the role of team analyst, mental coach, discussion leader for our various varsity teams and club teams. And this has really helped a lot of these teams to take a step back and understand what it means to be a part of a team. Um, we've connected primarily with folks who are interested in psychology to lead those roles because that will in turn help them find a career in that field. So those team, the mental coaches for us for sure have been one of the best additions to the program because they've been able to talk with students that are part of our varsity teams now about what does it mean to have mental fortitude? How do you bounce back from losses? How do you make sure that you're able to play again? Maybe it's in a half an hour or an hour after experiencing that, that huge loss or that huge win in some, in some instances. And they've been able to improve the team's consistency, uh, consistency through all of their competitions. We also have G, uh, GAs, our interns working with the teams on those various roles. So those are students who are currently studying psychology. They've been, they've been able to come in, talk to the teams, see where the issue is, and then go on, going along with the next one, do some research on campus uh, with some of the professors in regard to esports. We also have a variety of different doctoral students who are currently gaining experience in the realm of psychology with esports. So that's been great for us to be able to provide those opportunities. Anyone who's doing doctoral work in psychology may be interested in connecting with an esports program as well. So if you're leading a local esports club or a high school organization or a middle school organization, there may be a doctoral student or two somewhere in your region or area that's interested in connecting with the team to talk with the students, maybe lead some mental health sessions and gain more experience for themselves as well. And then externally, we provided some uh, medical and healthcare partnership opportunities for students. These have primarily been for students that are graduating or will graduate soon, but we've helped to drive that with some opportunities that I'm gonna talk about here in a few minutes. Uh, and then we've got the mental health class leaders at our rec centers and coaching centers. So we work with a couple different rec centers regionally that do mental health sessions related to esports. Some of the students that we have as part of our program have then in turn gone on to work for those institutions as well. And then finally, high school mental health sessions with teams. So again, we've got that connection with, with the high schools, connections with the local rec centers, and those are really helping to drive a lot of this opportunity for the students. So we've taken those partnerships, those opportunities, and really built in a variety of different experiences for our students. So getting to the third, the third slides here, you can see that there are a lot of connections we're building with local middle schools, a lot of connections with local high schools, 
a lot of connections with local rec centers. And I would suggest that any esports program do something similar. Or if you are a club or rec center, to connect with the local institutions at maybe the collegiate level, at the secondary level, at the tertiary level to find out, you know, do you have students that are interested? Okay, would you like to come help out and get experience or the opposite? You have students that are interested, maybe they have job opportunities where they can provide opportunities for those students to get that valuable experience while they're still in school. Action point here, I think is if you are a middle school, high school, or a club program trying to find is there a doctoral program somewhere near you or if not maybe somewhere online that you can connect with and folks maybe you're interested in coming to talk to the different teams about some of the mental health aspects and then in turn they're able to gain valuable knowledge for themselves uh, that they wouldn't have been able to get otherwise because finding these teams finding these team opportunities to do things like that is very difficult for folks in the field Next one here we have is sports management, which does tend to be fairly different from sports science, which we talked about in our second set of slides. Um, before we head into this, if you do have any questions while you're watching, feel free to ask in the chat and I will have them forwarded over to me so we can uh, get them taken care of here. So sports management being a little bit different here, um, this is again a pretty new field when it comes to esports. It's existed for quite a while in traditional sports, but for us, the reason why we focus on sports management is to provide opportunities for students uh, that are interested in event management, team management, space management, um, and there's just very few opportunities to gain experience for this. So if you look at a lot of esports jobs right now across the world, they're looking for experience. They're saying, okay, you have to have two years experience managing a team or five years experience managing a space, or you have to have prior experience with, uh, with event management. Where do students get this event management? Is this a magical event management hosting experience that they can create? No. We're, we're creating those experiences for them. So they're, they're going to school, they're, they're a college student, they're getting chances to do these event management opportunities, these event management experiences, these team management experiences. And that in turn really helps to lead to jobs down the road because they, they can't get that opportunity otherwise. So some of the jobs in the field, team manager, event host, preparation, organization, tournament organizers, referees as well here, uh, a lot of growing jobs in the field here for sports management. And this is one that we've really worked to develop over the last couple of years because we see so many students that are interested in this field and there's just, there's nothing out there that lets them get any experience. Uh, so for us, we do team management. So that's one varsity team has one varsity manager per team. So we've got seven teams. We've got seven managers. These are folks that are interested in doing it post-graduation as well. Some have taken that into the professional realm and moved into a job in esports. So they help the teams do scheduling. They help the teams do organizational strategies. Um, in addition to that, we've got students that work for the program that do event hosting and management. So that's student events, student management, where they'll come in and they'll talk to the different clubs on campus and say, okay, clubs, what do you guys want to do? How can we help you host an event? And then they plan the whole thing out they from start to finish. And then myself and the other professional staff members are there more as a, as a mentor for those folks in the program. Uh, and then we do event development and brainstorming as well with those folks. So they'll talk about, we want to do this event and then, okay, I'll help them plan out what do we need to do to get there? Who do we need to contact? How much money do we need to ask for? This, that, and another thing, because there's 20 different steps to make sure that the event goes off and giving the students the opportunity to manage those individual steps has been really important for them. And then we're doing outreach and collaboration uh, with internal and external programs as well. So for instance, we run a lot of collegiate leagues, collegiate tournaments, high school leagues, high school tournaments for local and regional teams to compete in. And we give our students the opportunity to, to, to do some of that outreach, to do some of the collaboration, to really reach out and kind of take take a hold of that event and make it their own. And then when they go in to have a job interview, they're able to say, well, Here's the event that I did from start to finish. Here was the problems that were associated with it. Here's how I solved those problems. Here's how we reached out to these different corporations, these different companies. Here's how we built these partnerships. And they're a great candidate for a lot of these jobs. That's really helped a lot of folks move into that professional field as well. 
and then external opportunities. So we've got some internships that we've developed uh, with esports organizations and governing bodies that are US based or Ohio based. That's been able to have students who are interested in getting that opportunity be able to have that opportunity with a with a professional organization as well as a collegiate organization. And then we've got local esports clubs that do event event hosting, event management. We've got students that work for them or or volunteer for them, and that gives them another resume line as well. So for here, for for sports management, if you've got folks or students that are interested in managing an event, maybe they're interested in event hosting. I would say give them an opportunity to run with it, right? If if you've got the opportunity to host an event and you've got folks that are interested act as the mentor for those people and then allow them to kind of brainstorm the event, allow them to plan the event, help with the execution, be there for when they fail, but provide them opportunities to experience success here. This has really led to us, you know, having great events as well, because the students have had great ideas. They've came up with really excellent strategies for a lot of this. So it's been fun to see. And then the last one here we're going to cover is communications. Give me one sec. left probably the biggest one till last because there are a ton of opportunities for folks who are interested in the communication side of things to really build a career while they're younger too. This isn't something you need to go to school for. This isn't something you need to graduate college and spend 20 years in education for. This is something you can start doing quite young. Uh, why, so, why communications? So social media and broadcasting is a fantastic way for students in the program to get some experience, but it also helps my program grow. It helps your program grow. If you've got students that are passionate about doing the social media and the broadcasting for your program, it'll be a great way to build brand. It'll be a good way for other students or other young individuals to hear about the program you're doing because of the social media, because of the broadcasting that you're able to do for the program. So this can really help you build your program and give students an opportunity to get into that job field. Uh, of course, there are a lot of jobs in the field, broadcaster, shoutcaster, social media specialist, uh, asset creation, design, those last two get a little bit more into the artistic side of things. But depending on what the what the job title looks like, if it's more of a social media type job, they can definitely have some asset creation and design in there as well, uh, as well as the broadcasting side has those into it as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the internal and external opportunities we have provided for students in the field of communications. So internally, we've been able to provide students the opportunity to broadcast and shoutcast for the program. So we've got students who lead our broadcasting team, students that lead our shoutcasting team, students on the back end doing the broadcasting, students on the front end doing the shoutcasting. Of course, we're there to teach them how to use the software, how to make sure everything's operating correctly, but it's largely up to the students to run a lot of these. And that's given them opportunities that they wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. Where else are they gonna have access to a semi-professional studio worth of equipment where they can come in and do those different types of broadcasting? Now, it doesn't have to be a studio, it could be a singular computer where you're operating a, a Twitch broadcast or something similar, but giving the students the opportunity to access that and to run with that is a great opportunity for them. Uh, in addition, students training other students to use various streaming platforms. Um, so this is some on our end where we, we start the process, we train some students and then giving the students an opportunity to lead other students or other classes of students to utilize various streaming tools. So for us, it's primarily vMix, OBS, and uh, Streamlabs OBS, which is fairly similar. But we use those programs to kind of pass data back and forth, give the students an opportunity to utilize those softwares, and gives them an opportunity to experience that in the job market as well. They also stream for our program. Uh, we've got a student-led group called the Stream Team that leads different their own streaming content, and that's helped them gain connection through the program. And we do social media management that is largely student-led as well. So we've got students that work for the program or volunteer for the program to do different social media engagement for the program. And that has allowed us to, one, get a lot better at what we're doing and what we're putting out there. And two, providing great opportunities for students to manage that social media platform. It's very difficult to get access to, if you're someone who's interested in, in social media, very difficult to get access to a large scale platform that you'd need to manage and have that job experience. So we're giving students an opportunity to do that while they're still in school. 
Externally, we've been able to partner up with a lot of different programs uh, or companies to provide students opportunities to do tournament organizational hosting, broadcasting, shoutcasting locally and regionally. So some of this has been saying, hey, high school down the street, we've got students that would be interested in casting your game or broadcasting your game. Can we do it? Most of the time, the answer is yes. Or we connect with uh, different organizations and say, hey, I, I see you've got a Rocket League tournament going on. I've got students that want to broadcast and shoutcast it. Can we do it? Most of the time, the answer is yes, because we're helping to promote their brand. And then in turn, our students are getting an opportunity to connect and, and utilize that knowledge. We do high school event and hosting, broadcasting for them as well. And then internships at local regional companies for social media broadcasting and design. So again, you're seeing, you know, there's a, a repeating trend of three different things, connections with local schools. So if you're an esports program, if you're a high school program, if you're a college program, if you're an elementary school program, connecting with local schools, regional schools, international schools to find an area for your students to, to get that, that connection, to get more experience. Then you're also seeing me repeatedly talk about connections with local rec centers. And a lot of that is because those are the areas where we can really drive engagement for community events and then partnerships and connections with local tournament organizers, regional tournament organizers, or anything in between, because that will really allow you to give your students an opportunity to do the broadcasting, to do the social media, to do the coaching, to event, to manage the event and get opportunities that they may not otherwise be able to get. So again, I would suggest reaching out to a wide variety of different entities and seeing where you may be able to provide some benefit to them. Reach out to different schools, reach out to different rec centers, reach out to different partnership opportunity places. And I know it's very daunting that the task of reaching out there and getting started on a lot of this uh, can be can be very, very difficult. Uh, it's, it's a lot to take in at first. My uh, my big piece of advice is you can definitely do it. So I would say start with one area. Don't try and do everything right away. Start with an area that you feel comfortable overseeing. So if you feel comfortable with the streaming aspect of things, start with that. If you feel comfortable with the psychology component, the mental health component, start with that. If you feel comfortable with the educational component, start with that. So for me, when we first started the program, I was very comfortable with the education component. That's my background. My background is primarily education. So I was very comfortable talking with students who are interested in coaching, who are interested in going to work at a local middle school, local high school, uh, working with the different teams, doing some of the data research, because that's what I'd been doing for years. I started with that and we kind of built the program from a variety of different angles. I kept involving different different professionals in the field who had a different area of expertise. And then we had them be mentors for a group of students. And then we're at where, where we got to where we're at today just by including a variety of different folks and saying, can you please be a mentor for some of these different folks? And again, that's, that's part of this as well is not trying to do everything by yourself. You know, you're only one person or your organization may not be that big. So you may not be able to handle every single thing we talked about, but you can probably do one or two. And then as you're able to pull more folks in who can provide and be a mentor for the program, be a mentor for the kids that are a part of your program, you'll be able to give more opportunities to more students and give more mentors opportunities to connect with a variety of kids. Um, also, too, I guess that I just talked about the second point there. The second point there is find more people that are interested. I know we all like to think that we can run the programs by ourselves, that we can make the perfect program for all the students out there, but that's not always a realistic possibility. So finding folks that are interested in, in helping to run the program can definitely help you in the long run because you'll be able to include them they can be a mentor for the students. They can provide a different angle, a different avenue of expertise, a different set of eyes onto the situation. And they'll be able to help engage the students in a way that you may have not been able to engage them, which is totally fine. And that gives them more opportunities to connect as well. And then finally there, my advice is to, to stay connected with other folks. So 
there are plenty of folks that are in a similar situation as what you're in right now. Start with them, ask them questions about what they're doing, ask for some advice. Don't be afraid to, to call somebody on the phone or to send them an email or send them a DM over whatever social media platform you're most comfortable with and ask how they did it, how they're working on what they're doing. Stay connected with others. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't invent any of this stuff. I kind of borrowed, stole, and uh, got my ideas from folks that are doing it, that were doing it well before me, as, as I think a lot of folks do. And what you want to do is in your program, make sure that you're just, you're connecting and, and keeping up with the best ideas in the field that you can, and that you're always moving forward with your ideas rather than being stagnant, because that's really what's going to doom your program. If you're just doing the same thing repeatedly over and over and over again, your program is never going to get any better. You're never going to be able to give more opportunities to students. So for this, I would suggest just keep moving forward, keep adding new things, keep adding new people and making sure that you're connecting with those folks and, and getting advice from them. Um, you can connect with me afterwards. So my email is up there on the screen, ntm2 at uakron.edu. If you've got any specific questions you'd like to connect with, I am happy to do that. I did get a question about where students can sign up for the program. I can go ahead and show that really quickly as well. But other than that, I will take some questions if there are any in the chat while we've got the stream up and running here. But again, you can feel free to connect with me at ntm2 at uakron.edu or on LinkedIn at, at Nate Meeker and you'd find me right there. Um, I'll go ahead and share the link here as well. So our program is just Akron Esports. It's the first and only thing that will pop up me a second to bring it up here. All right, let me go ahead and stop this screen share, bounce back over here, share this window right here. And yeah. So this is our website, uakron.edu slash esports. If there are students that are interested in signing up for our particular program at the varsity level, we've got a varsity sign up link uh, right here on the main page it says apply to be on the varsity team. It's a short little form. It is open to any student. It can be a regional student, can be a US based student, it can be an international student. Uh, it is open to anyone. Uh, as far as the general program is concerned, anything that we are doing normally is open to any University of Akron student. So folks that are interested in the broadcasting aspect of things, the shout casting aspect of things, they're more than welcome uh, to come on in and, and use our program totally for free. So it is open to any student. There's no application necessary. If you, if they are a University of Akron student, they can utilize any of those programs. Other than that, if there are no questions, that is all I have for you today. But I do appreciate everyone's time. Again, if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out at ntm2 at uakron.edu.